Hello and welcome back to the 2022 Food Service Summit. I'm Karen Patriarca Elliott, the e-learning developer with FAIR. Today's webinar is Decoding the Food Code, What Does This Mean for Food Allergens? Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce this session's presenter, Amber Potts from the National Environmental Health Association. And I will let Amber take it from here. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, well, welcome everyone. Yes, my name's Amber uh, Thompson. I just got married, so was previously POTS, but um, I'll share my screen and we will get started. Um, okay, so uh, again, I'm Amber POTS, work for um, National Environmental Health Association, and I have been working in the restaurant industry since I was 16. Um, started out as a hostess, and now uh, my current role is a senior project coordinator with NEHA. Um, spent 10 years in a local regulatory government inspecting food establishments, and I still actually do that part-time um, for the city that I live in. Um, so my interest in food allergens started uh, when I had my second daughter, who has a severe peanut allergy, and so that has opened me up into the world of food allergies. Um, graduated from the University of Texas at Dallas with a bachelor's in chemistry. I'm a registered environmental health specialist, a registered sanitarian, and a certified professional in food safety. So let's get started. Um, so I had to put this disclaimer on here. Um, while I'm knowledgeable in the FDA food code, I do not work for the FDA. I'm not an expert. Um, so this presentation really um, reflects my best knowledge and just my years of experience um, regulating uh, in food safety. Um, Again, doesn't represent the voice of the FDA, the CDC, or my employer. So, and you are uh, welcome to um, save and present this recording. I can download this, email it out, whatever you'd like. All right. Um, so today I'm talking about the 2017 FDA food code. And so when you see the word food code in capital letters, like you see on the first and second bullet there, um, I'm referring to the 2017 FDA food code, and that's normally how you see it. Um, if you see it, food code in capitals, the first part, it usually is referencing the FDA food code. Um, when it's not capitalized, such as the last bullet, I'm referring to whatever food code you are being regulated under. Um, and then at the very end of the presentation, there'll be a lot of website links where you can click and um, read some more information um, and see where I got all this information. Uh, yes, I welcome questions anytime in the chat. If there's a specific area you want to go over in detail, just let me know. I can't see the chat, so if someone can just monitor that for me, that'd be great. All right, so we have a first question here. I would like to know um, if you're familiar with the FDA food code. I'm going to answer. Let's see. Oh, I can't vote. Okay, well. All right. I just want to pull this over here. I don't know how long y'all normally give. There we go. Okay, so we have, how many people are here today joining us? We have 53 today. 53. Okay. So, wow. So over half of you know about it. That makes me happy. <laughs> um, oh, and some of you keep a copy on your nightstand. That, that makes it even better. <laughs> um, okay. So um, I just kind of wanted to see where we are. Um, that'll kind of help me guide the rest of the presentation. But here we go. Next one here. So when we say food code, the FDA food code is really a model. Um, it's not regulation per se. Um, it's basically the FDA's best advice um, and to give an example food code that a jurisdiction could adopt and use as their food code. Um, so it's science-based and legal-based. Um, however, it's not law and it's not enforceable unless your agency, your state agency, your city, whatever, has adopted it as their own food code. Um, the FDA, the government does not require your agency to adopt the FDA food code. It really doesn't 
or it doesn't say about adopting any food code, um, your own city can write their own food code if they'd like. And then of course, we'll talk about later, this is kind of why it seems like every city has uh, their own code because really they can write whatever they'd like. Um, okay. Another question. So for those who keep it on their nightstand, um, how many pages are in the food code? Let's see what we get here. All right, so I put nine in there. The nine is not the answer, but I put that in there because um, the the FDA, the government has the, the Paper Reduction Act. And if the FDA keeps it under 10 pages, they don't have to get it approved or if there's some kind of approval process they don't have to go through. But no, it's actually um, right under 800 pages. So um, it can be a bit daunting if you are looking at this, you, you've downloaded it, maybe you've printed it or you've seen it. Um, however, not all of it is codified language. Um, if you, and I'll show you in a minute the, the, the link to take you there, but it's broken down into eight chapters. Um, and at the end of all the chapters are what they call annexes or attachments. And that's really where I like, uh, the, the people who I inspect, the restaurants, the owners and managers, and you take a look at the food code and your city may not have the annex behind it, but if they've adopted the FDA food code, you can go back and look. The annex has the reasons why. So there's reasons why all these codes are here. And it's a good place to start if you really want to understand why am I, why is this a rule? Why is my inspector telling me to do this? Um, so it's a lot easier also to get staff buy-in. You know, if your if your staff doesn't want to do a certain thing, um, if you can explain to them why then um, they may be more likely to comply with that with that rule. And again, at the very end of the presentation, there'll be a link that'll take you directly there. All right. Um, and if you really want to know about the food code, um, the FDA put on this training. It takes about an hour and it's it's uh, it's a really cool training, actually, but it walks you through the food code and explains how it's written, why certain things are in capital letters, uh, how to read it, how to find things, what the references mean. <laughs> so um, again, there'll be a link to, but I encourage anyone that that has time or is even curious, um, it's about an hour long and it kind of goes into it and uh, it can be helpful too, because although your city may not have the FDA food code, it's probably written very similarly. And it's just kind of, uh, it gets you to know about how how codes are written, so. That course is there and it's free. All right, let me see if I can find the chat. So who writes the food code? So any ideas, you can put those in the chat. Oh wait, here's the chat. All right, so anyone wanna take a, take a stab at that? Not all at once. <clears throat> Food and Drug, FDA, Department of Health. Anybody else? Neha. <laughs> that would be awesome if we got to write the food code. Because most of the staff at Neha has inspected places and it would just be the greatest panel of experts in food and nutrition, along with a civilian panel, World Health Organization. Um, okay, so let some of you, uh, I think maybe all of you are right. So it's technically written, you know, by FDA, but it reflects input from a lot of things. A lot of people, um, you can help write the food code. I can help write the food code. Your regulators have a voice, your customers have a voice, and your industry has a voice. So the National Restaurant Association, um, academia has a voice. So I'll just read this statement um, on the FDA website. 
It says the 2017 edition reflects the input of regulatory officials, and I just pulled one off the list, Michigan Department of Agriculture. So they actually had put input into the food code industry, uh, public supermarkets, top golf, they're in there, academia, uh, the Ohio State University, and consumers that participated in the 2016 meeting of the Conference of Food Protection. All right. So, and I'll explain the Conference of Food Protection in a minute. Um, but currently and pre-COVID, the food code is updated every four years and sup supplemented every two years. So if you go on the website, you'll see 2017 food code. And then when you click on it, you'll see the 2019 supplement. And so the supplement um, maybe has an explanation in there, or maybe there was an error in the 2017 food code, but that will give you um, those kind of go together. Um, and okay, we will move to the next slide here. So um, CFP, Conference for Food Protection, um, it's your voice. So you want, you're thinking, well, how can I help write the food code? How can I get my idea in there? Or, I don't like this regulation. This regulation is outdated or there's new science behind this regulation. Um, the Conference for Food Protection can help you, uh, the FDA, to hear you. Um, so they hear, hear and resolve submitted and accepted issues. Um, and I'll explain in a minute what that is. Um, they provide guidance documents. And then lastly, they recommend changes to the food code. Um, so the Conference of Food Protection is a nonprofit organization from, originated in 1971. Um, and this is just from their website. It creates a formal process whereby members of industry regulatory, academia, consumer, and professional organizations are afforded equal input um, in development and or modification of food safety guidance. Um, so these uh, is a really important group of people here. Um, and currently I serve as a voting member on council two, which is the allergen committee. And we are working on developing an operational framework for food allergen prevention and control using existing research and other evidence-based materials. So um, when the council seats open um, and the committee seats open, which is usually after the conference, which next year will be after April, um, you can apply to be a member. And they have a list of who can be a member. It has to be representative of all those, what I mentioned before. Industry has to be on there, regulatory, academia, consumer, and professional organizations such as NEHA. Um, and I had asked or requested to be on the allergen committee. And, um, and you'll learn in a minute what the food code says about food allergens. And our group has been working uh, the past year on writing a document that can help your restaurant um, control allergens in their establishment. So that will be coming out next December. All right. So what does the food code say about food allergens? Well, it um, doesn't quite say too much. Um, sorry, let me just put that one. Okay. Um, the first time the word food allergen appears in the food code um, is actually in the definition section. So. It defines a major food allergen as what you see here in these pictures, milk, eggs, fish, crustaceans, shellfish, tree nuts, peanuts, wheat, soy, and coming soon, sesame. That will be in the next edition of the FDA food code. So this, these, these food items are the only ones that are technically regulated under the food code. And um, there are so many more out there, but these are what the actual code says that you have to regulate in your food establishment. Um, it also mentions that the definition of a major food allergen is a food ingredient that contains a protein derived from a food as specified. So for example, with milk, it's casein. So um, this is where uh, it would be very helpful for you as a restaurant owner or manager to do some research into these food allergens, because although an ingredient may not say milk, it, it may mean casein. So it's kind of just 
good to know what are these proteins um, for these foods and where could they possibly be in your uh, restaurant? Um, and then it goes on to say that does not include any highly refined oil derived from a food as specified. So that means um, peanut oil is technically a highly um, refined oil and does not count as a major food allergen. And the first time my daughter's um, allergist said that we can eat at Chick-fil-A, I did not believe him. <laughs> I know you have years of experience and you're a doctor, but I was like, I don't think so. Because I was so, I was so afraid. It's such a severe allergy for her. He was like, take her to Chick-fil-A and she can actually eat because it's peanut oil. And so I'm like, okay. So we went to Chick-fil-A and I had all my EpiPens laid out. Like take one, just like take a little taste, right? But she was able to eat it. So the food code um, says that it does not include those highly refined oils. Um, do we have any questions so far? Okay, let's see. We have one here. I'll just do this. By chance, is your committee looking at requiring manufacturers to label food allergens intended for food service? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, my specific committee is not looking at manufacturers. So the FDA food code is not used to regulate manufacturers. They have their own set of codes and a set of requirements. I'm actually going to get to that in a minute and I'll explain further. Um, but this intended for food service is a really uh, hot topic within FDA and talks amongst ourselves too as food safety professionals. Um, but uh, I have my email if you want to email me later, but that's a, that's a really good question and a really good phrase that we've been we've been looking at. Um, let's see. Where on the food code can I find the oil statement? Okay. Um, let's see here. This is going to be exactly in the food code. Uh, it is in chapter one, page 12. So chapter one is definitions. Um, page 12 is where it says major food allergens. And all that says it about the oils. It's in um, under B2. Um, and then it goes on to say any ingredient that is exempt under the petition or notification process specified in food allergen labeling and consumer protection act of 2004. So this is where we talk about your manufacturers, right? Um, they can petition, um, to not have to label something because of some kind of process that removes that, that allergen protein from the product. Um, okay, and then just a quick tip, if you see a word or phrase in all capital letters, let me show you my notes to show you what I'm talking about. So I copy and pasted this from the food code. You see food in capital letters. Um, that means you can, you can find it's, that means it's defined in the food code. You can go back to the definition section and find that. Uh, omega-3 supplementation. I'm not sure about omega-3 because of fish. I don't know. Um, krill oil, vitamin D supplementation. Not good to recommend clients. Vitamin D supplements with krill oil if they're allergic to seafood. Um, I really don't know the specifics of the proteins or oils derived from those products. Um, I can surely try and find the answer for you. Um, but again, I, I don't really, I don't know. Um, okay, let's, supplements are not regulated by the FDA. Oh, um, I think they are, but the statements are not regulated, such as any health claims that the supplement can give you, the FDA doesn't back up those health claims. I think, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they're, that they regulate supplements manufacturing. So. Uh, okay, Zoom question. According to the food code, who is the person in charge? So if you own a restaurant and you've been regulated and you've ever had an inspection, um, 
who do you think, who do you think the food code says is the person in charge? So let's just see about that. Okay, so we think that most people think it's the owner or permit holder, and not many people think it's the chef. Um, so actually, um, according to the food code, uh, the person in charge uh, is an individual present at the food establishment who is responsible for the operation at the time of inspection. Literally, anyone can be the person in charge. And this is a very important person to regulators. And it's very vague in the code. So when I used to do inspections, I would walk in. My name's Amber. I'm here to do an inspection or facility, routine inspection. Um, normally they would say, oh, let me get the manager or owner or whatever. And if they didn't know, they're like, well, manager's not here. Owner's not here. Okay. Well, um, um, can I do my inspection? Yeah. So, so who's, who's in charge today? And someone will raise their hand. I'm in charge today. It could be the cashier. It could be the janitor. Um, according to the food code, they are now the person in charge, which is defined in the food code. And they have a lot of responsibilities in the food code. So, um, the food code does require that a person in charge be present at all times. So we'll go into that further here. So they must, they're the MVP. They're the most important person food safety wise in your establishment. Um, by code, they must be present during all hours of operation. That includes opening and that includes closing. They have to be able to answer my questions. And I will have a lot of questions. Um, because the food code requires me to ask a lot of questions, demonstration of knowledge, right? You have to demonstrate that you're knowledgeable in food safety. And especially if I'm not seeing you or your establishment exhibit food safety practice, I have a lot more questions for you. Um, and then I put this one in italicized because the 2017 food code says that the person in charge must be a certified food protection manager, certified through ANSI accredited, um, a place, place that's ANSI accredited. Um, I've seen that uh, jurisdictions that adopt the food code don't adopt this specific part of the code um, because it can be expensive. It can be upwards of $300 to become a certified food protection manager. And obviously no one can be there at all times. So you'll need more than one person in charge, which is fine. We encourage that. Many people can be people in charge, but that would require that every person in charge be a food protection manager. So that can get expensive. So that's why I put that in italicized. Some cities may require it and some cities may not. Um, so before I move off this, I just want to emphasize the importance of the person in charge. Um, so I've inspected over 10 years, close to 4,000 inspections. Um, and in my opinion, if I walk in and nobody claims to be in charge, this has happened multiple times from mom and pop restaurants to five-star restaurants. I walk in and nobody's in charge. Nobody wants to claim to be in charge. Um, immediately I think food safety is not a priority at this establishment. And more often than not, they fail their inspection. So read the food code or your food code, figure out what is required of the person in charge and then designate a few people who can rotate. All right, in, in regards to food allergens, that's, that's what I'm gonna cover here today. There's a lot more duties, but as it relates to food allergens, there are some responsibilities of that person in charge. Um, Unfortunately, for those of us with allergens or family members with allergens, it's not really much. So the person in charge must be able to describe the major food allergens and their symptoms. So they have to know those food allergens that I listed, and they have to know what symptoms they may cause. And then it says, in a sensitive individual who has an allergic reaction, that's what the code says. Um, so. And that's it. So the second bullet, it's very, very, very vague. It says this, it says, um, they shall ensure that employees are properly trained in food safety, including food allergy awareness as it relates to their assigned duties. So this is where we are working on this operational framework because if I'm doing an inspection 
that's so vague, right? So I'm doing an inspection and you are the cashier. Well, what are your duties as it relates to food allergy awareness? If you write the menu, you'll have different duties. If you're the chef, you'll have different duties. So that's what our committee is working on to kind of define what the duties would be, how you can write a framework, an SOP for your restaurant. Um, any questions about this one before I move forward? Okay. All right, so let's see if we can describe a symptom that a major food allergen could cause in a sensitive individual who has an allergic reaction. So that is one duty of the person in charge. So you can put that in the chat. Impending doom. Yes, that's true. Especially in uh, small children, they just feel like something's wrong, right? Rash, trouble breathing, difficult. Yep. Death. Yes. All right. Yeah, you're all getting it. This is perfect. Um, I remember I was on some blog or something. And I remember a young lady had said, so I think it was about an airplane. Why do I, why can't I eat peanuts on an airplane? Why, why did they stop doing that? Just because somebody's tummy will hurt. So I think those of us who are not in the food allergy world um, have limited or ignorant in this. Um, it doesn't cause a tummy ache. I mean, it can, but it can also cause death. So I'm really happy to see that you guys know the symptoms. This is great. Um, so here are some, uh, exactly what, what you all said. Trouble breathing, nausea, vomiting, tingling in the mouth. And it can, it can appear very different in children. And this is also something we're adding to our allergen framework for restaurants. Um, because a child, especially one that's nonverbal, can't express my throat is swollen, my tongue is itchy. So we have some pictures in our framework that will kind of help a restaurant or a waitress identify those. Um, let's see here. Again, we know symptoms can vary person to person, depending on the severity of the allergy. So um, the most severe of the symptoms is anaphylaxis. So I pulled this definition from your website, foodallergy.net, a severe, potentially life-threatening allergic reaction. Symptoms can affect several areas of the body, including breathing and blood circulation. It is a medical emergency, and the only treatment is epinephrine. Um, if not treated quickly or properly, it can result in death. Um, what, what we're kind of putting in our framework for restaurants is if you suspect a patron is going into anaphylactic shock, call 911. That's the first thing you need to do. If you suspect someone is allergic, has, has, has having a reaction, um, don't try to be the doctor. Just call 911 and say, I think someone's having a food allergy reaction and they'll know what to do. They'll be able to help you. Um, okay, so we're going to kind of jump quickly over to food allergen labeling in the Consumer Protection Act. And so this has a little bit of an impact in retail food. Um, a lot of retail food operators are not food manufacturers, but some can be. Um, I think we're good on time. So we'll go ahead. Um, so in 2004, um, the, the food allergen awareness picked up steam with the Food Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act of 2004. This public law was enacted in August of 2004 and addresses, among other issues, the labeling of foods that contain certain food allergens. So what does this mean for retail food? When I say retail food, I mean restaurants, I mean grocery stores, um, convenience stores, delis, things like that. Um, foods packaged in your establishment are required to be labeled. So what does packaged mean? Well, well, the food code actually defines packaged. So it doesn't mean a to-go box. It doesn't mean you put something in a cup and you seal it 
or will you, you know, you close it and you hand it to a customer. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about um, making a product, packaging it and shipping it. The consumer doesn't walk into your food establishment and ask the waitress or hostess for the product and they bring it out. So we know that they have to list the name of the food, major food allergen, if it's not already an ingredient. Um, so let's say, for example, it's uh, Reese's Pieces, Reese's Peanut, or some kind of peanut product. Um, if you look at the ingredient list, it says peanuts as an ingredient. Um, you technically don't have to list where it says may contain peanuts because it's already an ingredient, but I've really never seen it not done that way. Just I think for liability purposes, they do that. Um, let's see. I would, uh, add, if you're curious, okay, I'm packaging something in my restaurant. Does that mean I have to label? Ask your local health department. Um, again, that term packaged is very vague. So I suggest you call your health department and say, hey, we're packaging these cookies, we're ma mail mailing, whatever it is, and they'll be able to tell you. Um, and then an interesting fact I learned recently is that the statements you see on the labels, such as processed on shared equipment or processed in an establishment that also processes peanuts are actually voluntary statements and not required by code. So I thought that was interesting. What about your committee's thoughts on the voluntary statements? Yes, I know. Um, we would love, and again, we're not the labeling section, so it's CFR, which is uh, code of code of federal regulations. We can't. We can only ch change what's. We can only influence, right? What's in the FDA food code, and so what the FDA food code has done here is they reference a different code. They reference the code of federal regulations that tells you all about labeling. Um, we unfortunately have no say because, and I'm not sure how the code or federal regulations is written. I don't know if there's committee groups that can actually help um, sway or, or uh, put input on that, but that's a good question. Okay. And again, the FDA food code is not your food code unless your regulating body has adopted it. Um, and so this gets into the big issue of I own five McDonald's in five different cities and I'm under five different food codes. Some require me to do this, some don't require me to do that. And that is all because a local state municipality can write their own food code. They can adopt the FDA food code. If they want to adopt the 1995 version of the FDA food code, they surely can do that. So this is why you're seeing so many different rules. Um, question here, do you know how to find your food code? Let's see. I don't know how many restaurant owners we have here today, but let's just see if we know how to find our food code. Let's see, I see a question in here that says, do some states use the retail food code as what defines practices for restaurants? I recently was dissuaded. Washington state must have food codes separate from retail food code. Uh, yes, so that gets, so the question is asking about retail food code versus, versus food code. Again, so a, a local municipality, let's say Washington State, they can decide to have a general food code that define like retail food code. Well, they've defined retail in there. If they want 10 different food codes for 10 different types of establishments, they can do that. Um, and we'll go into how to find your food code because it looks like over half of us don't know how to find it. Um, even as a regulator, I will tell you, it's not easy. <laughs> I would get, um, I did mobile food. And so this food truck would say, Hey, I'm permitted in so-and-so County. Um, or I'm, I'm trying to open a, I have friends in, in restaurant business. I'm trying to open a restaurant in so-and-so city. What's the food code? And I'm like, well, let's Google. Cause I don't know. So we're going to go into, um, okay. So the first thing you want to do 
the easiest, quickest thing is to ask your inspector. Whoever issued your permit, give them a call. Building inspections, um, you can go on your jurisdiction's website. Um, and then you can go on the FDA's website, but that's for states only. So I'm going to get through this because I have a, we can practice this. So um, if somebody wants to give me a name of a town, city, state, parish that your restaurant's in, we will try to find the food code. Um, again, we'll start with state. Seattle, Washington, River Falls. Uh, let's hear. So we click this. So Harris County, Texas, only because I know the answer, but because um, I'm in Rockwell, uh, Texas. So the, this list that I, I show you here is the state code. And just because you reside in that state doesn't mean your city uses the state food code. So it gets very, very complicated. Um, for example, Texas has a food code. That's where I'm from. We've adopted the 2017 FDA food code in the state of Texas. However, Harris County is not going to be the state food code. Um, so we can go in. Let's. I think there was Seattle, Washington. So let's start with Washington. So this tells you... Um, you can actually see the food code. This is Washington State. Um, it pulls up here. And then you can go on to read about it. And usually in the preface, you can see who, if they've adopted it or not. So, so we know that Washington Department of Health and Food. So that's it. So um, honestly, if... Like I said, it's not the easiest thing. I wish there was a button you could click and see your food code. Um, Seattle, Washington's King County, I'm pretty sure. So you just have to Google. Um, you want to either search health department, um, environmental health, probably here, environmental health services. Um, you're looking for food protection. Um looks like they are on the Washington State Food Code. So that's how I do it. That's how I tell my friends who are in the restaurant business to do it. Um, if you're, so it's, I wish I had an easier answer, but that's what I got. Um, let's see. Um, so what's next? Um, Sesame will be added as an allergen in the 2022 FDA food code. I don't know when it will be published. I've heard through the grapevine, it may be December, but it also may be next December. However, it will be called the 2022 FDA food code. Um, and then again, our food allergen framework, which will present to the conference for food protection in April, ask them to publish it on their, on their website and hopefully it'll be published December of 2024. Um, and it should be available there. So it'll be time for questions, but I just wanna tell you a story really quick, uh, the importance of food, of regulating food allergies. Um, and being, even though there's not much about food allergies in the food code, as in you're required to do, it's really important to familiarize yourself with these um, so, uh, again, my daughter has a severe peanut allergy, um, and we went out to this chain restaurant. Uh, we had never been there before with her. So I usually sit near the, uh, area where I can see into the kitchen in this particular place. It was an open concept. I could see right into the kitchen and we, she ordered a Sunday and I asked to make sure there's no peanuts on it. So I'm watching the pass through window and, uh, someone places the, the Sunday up there and there's peanuts on it. And I can, I can see the, the waitress saying like something like whatever, you know, she did, they didn't want peanuts. He takes it and he scrapes the peanuts off and hands it back. And so you can just see the ignorance, the lack of knowledge. Like if my daughter had eaten that, she could have gone into anaphylactic shock. She's so allergic to peanuts that scraping them off is not the answer. Um, so I just think as a restaurant owner, operator, manager, um, explain this to your staff that it doesn't cause just a little tummy ache. Uh, it can actually 
it can actually it can actually be fatal. So I just want to end with the importance of that. Again, my references, you can learn all about CFP. There's the decoding the food code training. The FDA food code will take you to all the FDA food codes. And then here's more about the Food Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act of 2004. So uh, questions, thoughts, comments? Um, I'm open to in anything you guys uh, want to discuss. How much longer do I have? Do I end at 45? Yeah, we just have a couple minutes left and we do have a question. Okay. So how does the food code transfer over, I guess is the right way to ask this, I'm not sure, to college campuses versus restaurants? Right. Um, so probably, and I say this because I don't know exactly how it works in all places, but um, the campuses are considered retail food establishments. Um because anyone can walk in and get food. So likely they're regulated by the municipal that they're in, uh, health department. So let's say Seattle, Washington, um, there is a college campus and uh, that college campus is regulated by King County because we just saw that. King County uses the state food code. So they would be regulated under the Washington state food code. Um, there's probably, there probably are instances where that's not, but that would be my first uh, thought on that one. When in doubt, go to the state health department and look and see. I'll say that again. But when in doubt, go to the state health department and look and see if you can find any information. Right, right. So, um, anybody that conveys food to the public and I say convey because whether it's for sale or not, if you convey food to the public, you are regulated under the health code, whatever health code that may be. You, you need a permit. And so likely in your kitchen, there's a permit hanging on the wall that because that's required to show to the public. If you look on that permit, there'll be a name of a city, a county, a state, there'll be a person. Um, that's where I would go first. Whoever issued you that permit is more than likely regulating you. Um, so yeah, perfect answer. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I think that's all we have time for today. It is exactly 145. So thank you to Amber and to all those who joined this session today. This was awesome. So thank you again, Amber. This was amazing. We appreciate yep. your time Anytime. so much. You're welcome. Thank, thank you everyone. Thank you so much.